said it greatly. Brother Matthew, thank you. God is good. Let's be seated. Let us be seated. Isn't that awesome? Oh, yes. Praise the Lord. Uh, Christian, can you please do me a favor? If you can help me summon maybe either Emmanuel or um, Bennett, because we should be wrapping up shortly. So if they can just be on standby. God is good. Now, uh, Brother Matthew, I need you to stand up for a moment. And uh, Brother Matthew's parents are here. His mom is here. His stepdad is here. I know that. Praise God. So we've got Lady Celia here and Brother David. I know we didn't tell you ahead of time, but you look so well-dressed. We have to bring you up on stage if you don't mind. Yes, I, I, I know you'd, yeah, especially, yes, given your schedule, because I know you have to be out of here shortly. But if there are no steps on that side, there are steps on this side. Well, there you go. Who needs steps when you have Jesus? Come on. Praise God. All righty. And um, I was already thinking of calling you to come up here before Matthew stepped down. And then he started to say, none of you that gets to leave father and mother and brothers and sisters for the kingdom's sake will not receive. None of you that gets to leave family will go without receiving family of the Lord. But that's what we hear. That's what we read and that's what we stress, especially missionaries like my wife and I. We've left, you know, our families behind and we were in the UK for a while, started making friends and had to leave those ones, went to England, had to, I mean, the, to Canada. And every time we're always saying, well, when we leave them behind, God has more for us. But we don't remember to talk about the ones that we get to leave behind. The sacrifice that that is on their part. And so we know you make a lot of sacrifices to get Matthew overseas and you've been missionaries yourself, especially you for perhaps, I don't even know, maybe 40 years or so. And so all that sacrifice is appreciated. The Bible says that God is not unrighteous, praise the Lord, to forget your labor of love. And we just want to say that we love you, we appreciate you, and we thank you for the sacrifices you make for the gospel. God bless you greatly. God is good. All righty, that's it. Yeah, unless you want to say something, Brother David, please go ahead. Well, on behalf of Celia and myself, we want to thank Communion House for your graciousness and your generosity and your steadfast support through prayer and finances for, for Matthew. Um, yes, uh, I'm going to be retiring from uh, full-time missionary work to the Democratic Republic of Congo at the end of this year. And it, it heartens me to know that I have a son in India, and we also have children in Tajikistan. And praise God, uh, as uh, John wrote in 3 John 4, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. Thank you. God bless you. Praise God. Thank you so very much. And thank you again, Sister Celia. Oh, yeah. It's a pleasure. Thank you so very much. I appreciate you all greatly. And I'm telling you, it is such a legacy to have been missionaries and to also have raised other missionaries. God is good. I mean, look at the testimony. You know, I mean, the testimonies. You know, one after another, people getting baptized. You know, people seeing the word of God come to pass in their lives. You know me, I am very big on the ministry of remembrance. God bless you. Thank you so much. God is good. Hallelujah. I am very big on the ministry of remembrance. You see, because quite often, the reason why we do not receive as much as we should of the Lord is because we are quick to forget his benefits. The Bible says, forget not his benefits. On the leadership call on Thursday, Alan brought to our remembrance a verse of scripture from Numbers chapter 14, wherein the people of God were getting ready to stone Joshua and Caleb. Why? The Bible says they were getting ready to stone them because they were standing on the word of God. The same people that God delivered out of Egypt, the same people that went through the Red Sea on dry land, the same people that left the experience of the Red Sea with 12 boulders as a memorial to the Lord. But as soon as they face opposition, guess what? They forget what God did yesterday. If there's any delay in receiving what they need today, then God becomes a baddie. God becomes a bad person. He becomes an absent God. 
And that's why the ministry of remembrance is critical. The Word of God says, do not forget His benefits. When Jesus was introducing the Holy Spirit to the disciples, what did He say? He says, the Father will send you another comforter of the same kind. He said, He's sending you another one like me. Alos Paracleto, which means another one of the same kind that is called to be alongside with you. And what will He do? Is he going to help you raise the dead? That wasn't the first thing Jesus said. Is he going to help you to convict the world of sin? That is not the second thing that Jesus said. He said he will bring to your remembrance everything that I have told you. The primary ministry of the Holy Spirit is to bring to our remembrance. Many of us are not harnessing the power of remembrance enough. And that is the reason why we do not see the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. So why am I stressing that? Look at what brother Matthew said. He would go back and listen to what the Lord has said. Even though it was in a different time zone, he would be aroused by the Lord in the middle of the night to get up and go and listen to messages that had been preached. What we were preaching in the daytime, at nighttime, he would listen and through those, God spoke to him. John sent me maybe about seven or eight videos yesterday. You know, I thought he was being generous until I heard that he has about 240. And I'm like, you have 240, but you only sent me eight. You know, but I'm thankful that he sent me those videos. Some of them went back to one of the very first meetings, some of the very first meetings that we had here at Communion House. And even as I was listening to those messages, again, two minutes here, three minutes there, my heart was filled with joy. My bones were filled with strength because there were things that I heard that I had even forgotten about. And it is our duty to ensure that we do not let any one of the benefits that God has bequeathed us with to go unutilized, to go unremembered. And so I want to encourage you guys, while you're begging God for a fresh word, God is asking you what you did with the last word. It is the one that is faithful and literal that God is going to give much to. You see, and we have a lot of messages, you know, almost every week here at Communion House, there are three, four meetings. We have two physical meetings, usually Tuesdays and, and, and Saturdays. We have teachings on Fridays. We have prayers on Wednesdays at night on Instagram. We have all of these many things. We're not even talking about the prayers and the meetings that go on in the various groups, the men's group, the women's groups. There is more than enough resource for each and every one of us to go to. And yet we complain that we haven't heard what God is saying. We're stressing about hearing God concerning a particular situation. Whereas the word that you need was probably two meetings ago. And so I want to encourage you, let us go back and remind ourselves of the things that have been said. Why did Jesus say to the disciples, wait for the Holy Spirit. He will remind you. And he also said to them, as often as you have the opportunity... Break bread in my name. Do this in remembrance of me. Because he is the one that made us. And he knows that one of the biggest problems facing humanity is forgetfulness. A lot of the foolishness that is going on politically today is because people do not remember where we're coming from. A lot of the errors that we're making investment, a lot of what happens in the economy is because we just forget what has once happened. When Solomon said there is nothing new under the heavens, he said what is, is what was and what will be is what is. So we just need to remember because when you remember, then you begin to identify more clearly the patterns of existence. And so I want to encourage you, you know me, I always tell you, I am happy to encourage you to go and listen to past messages and past prophecies. Not because every time you listen, I get paid. Our YouTube page is not monetized. Our Spotify is not monetized. So if you can watch it a million times, we don't get a dime. Somebody says, well, why are you leaving money on the table? Well, it's not intentional, but at the end of the day, it's good. Because we can be confident to say that it doesn't matter how many times you listen to it. It is mostly for your own good. Paul said, for me to say a thing to you repeatedly is not grievous, but for you it is safe. There is safety in revisiting prophecy. 
Oh, there is safety in revision in prophecy. Because quite often, I'm telling you, God does not have to repeat himself. You just have to remind yourself of what he has said. You know, but this generation that we're in, we have been raised to be dependent on the system to the point wherein we are always expecting the system to do things for us. And we take that attitude and we apply it to what God, we're always expecting God to do things for us. And God said in his word, I am not your slave. He says, you are my co-laborer. We're working together. I do my part, you do your part. But what we want is we want God to do everything. So you want him to keep repeating himself. And it's like, well, if that's where you're at, We'll see you later. We'll see you when you're ready to move with the cloud of glory. God is good. And so let's go and um, go on to the promise that was made from Tuesday. You know, on Tuesday, as we were getting ready to wrap up, the Lord showed me a man that was struggling to go up a hill. And the Lord says, this service, there will be healing and there will also be instruction in righteousness for receiving the wisdom for surmounting mountains that otherwise are slippery. And why is it important for us to know and be skillful in the art of mountain climbing? I gave you one of those reasons. One of those reasons is that the, is the fact that God has many goodies for you on the mountains. The ram that was caught in the thicket when Abraham was to sacrifice Isaac was where? Was on the mountain. God had to tell him to come up the mountain because there are blessings up there where no one can mess with. Because it's always cooler on the mountains, so there is better preservation on the mountains. Another reason why we need to be sure of how skillful we are in some mountain mountains is because there are always obstacles and oppositions until you get to the mountains. The Bible says there are mountains to climb, there are valleys to walk, but before me there is an open door. I never understood that scripture until sometime in 2000 and. No, it's not even 2000 and it was in the year 1999. About 99 going into 2000. I was surrounded by so much opposition, so many obstacles in the way of the destiny that God has promised me and yet my prophetic gift was active. Now, let me tell you something. When your prophetic gift is active in your time of difficulty, while you are in the valley, it can almost be like a curse. Because I was seeing very clearly what God has for me, including the children that I would have, that we would have. I was seeing very clearly the businesses that I would do, places that I would go to. But there was nothing around me that was pointing in the direction of experiencing the fulfillment of that destiny. And so I was there, I was crying before the Lord, I was waiting upon the Lord, I was fasting several times for days, just ongoing, simply because I knew that something had to give. Because he doesn't lie. And when he shows it to you, it's because it's already happened. God does not make up images just to excite you. He only shows you what he has already done. The Bible says by these two immutable things, it is impossible for God to lie simply because he has made an oath by himself and another by his name. And what is taking an oath by oneself when you are the ancient of days? What that means is everything that you say has already happened because you are the one that was, that is, and is to come. And so I knew the things that I was seeing were things that had already happened, but how to get to that place Seemed like an impossible. And by the way, remember, also because of the prophetic gift, I had become Billy, no friends. Oh yeah. You know the prophetic gift for some reason likes a lot of solitude. Oh yeah. When you find crowds around the prophet, it's probably because they were on assignment to stone him. Now, I'm not saying that jokingly, but prophets and the prophetic gift is usually very alien to a lot of following. So I'm talking about a season in my life wherein I literally had but one friend. And that one friend was honest enough eventually to tell me that he was just with me because he was starting a ministry and he wanted to rub off on me because for some reason he knew he needed the anointing. He told me, he said, you know that I lied to you about not having a place to stay? I said, I knew. I said, because before you came to me, the Lord told me that you were coming to give me a cock and bull story. He said, but you didn't say anything. I said, because the Lord just told me for my information. I didn't have to tell you. It was after an evening service, he came to me and he was like, oh, I'm so sorry. You know, I don't know if I can come stay with you. I can tell you that story because we've laughed about it. 
I said, no, I didn't have to say anything, but the Lord told me. But then also, even if I felt like saying something, I finally had somebody who didn't think that I was a beast. Somebody was willing to come put up with me. My last roommate, he left me as though I was a burning bush. Like I was dangerous. And so I was happy for him to come. And so when he told me that, he said, I just came here. He said, because I knew God was speaking to you. And I knew that you were getting closer and closer to God. I wanted to have a piece of that. I said, well, you're welcome. As you can see, but that, even after a while, he could not take any more of the dealings of God with me because God really wanted me to be by myself. That season in my life, I sought God and I said, God, how are we going to make it through this season? I prayed myself to sleep and then I found myself in a place wherein there are no oppositions, no obstacles. And the Lord said to me, he says, this is what I promised you, that before you, there will be an open door. He said, but only after you have climbed to the mountain. He said, because until you get to the highest place that you can be, there will always be oppositions. You need to rise at every level to the highest place for that level that you can be. It is a song that the eagle sings. How many animals can say that before them there is always an open door? Only the eagle, because the eagle can always fly to a place wherein there are no mountains and there are no winds, there are no trees, there are no oppositions, literally an open door. It is very critical for us to know how to get there though, because when he showed me it was a vision, I wasn't there yet. I needed to figure out how to get there. You see, there's a reason why God is empowering us in this season to learn how to climb not just any mountain, but a slippery mountain. The beauty of a slippery mountain is that it is the most blessed experience when, once you get to the top. What makes a mountain slippery is, in, is an indication that it is very rich and very endowed. Let me explain to you the geology of slippery mountains. Slippery mountains are the ones that have a combination of water and minerals. Minerals are usually like salt. When you have water mixed with salt, it becomes slippery. And those mountains are the ones that are richest in all kinds of good things. But they are the most difficult to climb. You can climb a dry mountain that is in the wilderness that has absolutely nothing to offer. You can almost climb it with your eyes closed because everything is dry and dusty. But God wants you to go onto this mountain that is beautiful. Let me tell you, one of the most important reasons why you need to learn how to climb the mountain is because God is not anywhere but on the mountain. He's a mountain God. God can come and visit you while you are in the valley of the shadow of death. He can pay you a visit with a word of encouragement when you are still on the side of the mountain. But God does not live in the valley. He doesn't live on the side of the mountain. God lives on the mountain. Now oh, you don't believe me? Come with me to the book of Psalms chapter 48. There are so many scriptures. In fact, we're going to read a couple of scriptures letting you know that God lives on the mountains. Psalms 48. David describes the mountain of God and how luscious that mountain is, how rich that mountain is. Now look at what it says, Psalms 100, no not 100, Psalms 48 verse 1. It says, great is the Lord and greatly to be praised in the city of our God in his holy mountain that is beautiful for elevation, the joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion on the sides of the north, the city of the great king. God lives on a mountain. In Isaiah chapter, chapter two, one of the scriptures that God gave to us as we were starting communion house, what does it say? It says, let the mountain of God come to the mountain of God. When we received that word from God, I'm like, wow, I've read this Isaiah before, several times in the 90s, perhaps. I said, but I've never seen that a mountain will come to a mountain. And the Lord is saying, yes, because that is my promise to you that I would take you from one level of glory to a higher level of glory. God expects you to be a mountain dwelling being. 
But for every mountain that you reside with the Lord, there is a higher mountain that you need to go to. But if you want God to spend time with you and you want to spend time with God, you need to be a mountain dwelling person because he dwells in the mountains. And it is from the mountain of God that the, that the river flows. The Bible says, and the river flows from the mountain of God and it flows bringing with it peace wherever it goes. What will bring you peace wherever it goes brings you challenges while you are seeking it. Because when that water finally makes it to the ground with all of the nutrients that he's packed with, he brings you the power to create Eden wherever it goes. Do you know that after God planted the garden east of Eden, God knew that, the, and by the way, do you know that Eden was a very high place? Because God was in Eden and we know he dwells on the mountains. And so when the river of God was flowing from Eden, the Bible says it became four river heads. And everywhere that it went to, it had one mission, to water the entire region of Avila where the garden of Eden was. So the sustenance of your life is very much dependent on what comes out of that mountain and what flows down from that mountain of God. But when you are going to seek the Lord and to honor his invitation to come, you have to deal with the slippery slide or side of the mountain of God. God wants to make sure that not just any Tom, Dick, and Harry will show up in his presence. You have to know how to get there. You need to know how to navigate. Because if everybody can just show up in the mountain of God, it will become a congested place. And I just can't imagine the mountain of the, of the great thing, of the great king being a congested place. It is by invitation only, because if you do not receive an invitation to come to the presence of God, you do not even have the map or the assistance or guidance to get there. God wants you to learn how to arise and climb that mountain. You know the same Isaiah chapter 40 that we're always quoting. In fact, let's read it together. Isaiah chapter 40 verse 30. I like the book of Isaiah very greatly. I kind of miss it because lately the Lord's been speaking to us very much from the book of Jeremiah. God's spoken to us a great deal in recent times from Jeremiah. And even Brother Matthew read to us again today from Jeremiah chapter 22 verse 16. Very fantastic scripture. But my favorite one is 22, 22 for this season. And I have my reasons. Come on now. So now let's see. The Bible says, if I let me just quickly read this one to you because Verse 4 says, every valley shall be exalted, every mountain shall be brought low, the crooked places shall be made straight, and through the rough places, and the rough places shall be made smooth. The glory of the Lord shall be revealed. Where do you see the glory of God? After the mountains have been brought low. The easiest way to bring a mountain low is for you to rise high. Just have that little nugget. You see, because when the Lord speaks sometimes, yeah, you see, the mountain shall be brought low, when you rise high, you see this thing? This thing was higher than my feet while I was here. But this thing can be brought low when I rise to it. And then the glory of God is revealed. The people who have seen the glory of God have seen the glory of God on the mountain. When Peter, James, and John saw Jesus, Moses, and Elijah, they had to go to the mountain. When Moses saw the shadow of the glory of God, if we can even call it that, but it's more literally like the backside of the glory of God, he had to see that where? On the mountain. God's made it very clear that if you truly want to have an experience of who God is, to see God in his holy habitation, not just when he's on the move, not just when he's doing stuff, but when he is seated on the throne, wherein you can have a tent, a tent with God, it has to be on his mountain. Isaiah chapter 40, we've just read where it says the glory shall be revealed. Let's go to verse 30. Verse 30 of Isaiah says, Verse 31 of Isaiah 40, it says, but those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. Now, the Holy Spirit is motioning me to give you a couple more incentives before telling you how to climb the mountain. You see, the mountain of God, let me just put it this way, because I know there are people that God has connected to communion house because God wants to develop and sharpen their prophetic gift and utterances. Because kind begets kind. When God was going to raise Elisha, he first of all sent him to Elijah so that there can be an impartation. So that kind can beget kind. And so I don't joke with the people God sends around me. In fact, I turn certain people back because I know they do not have the constituent material 
to be developed into the prophetic. And so I don't want to waste their time and mine. I've been in the business of time wasting for too long and the Lord's recently told me I've wasted pretty much enough time. So these days, if you come around the work and you tell me that God is sending you, I test your spirit. The Bible says, test all spirits that you may know that which is of God simply because I am done casting my pearl before swine. If you don't have the constituent material that we can work together with under the instruction of the Lord to be developed into the prophetic, don't waste my time. Don't waste your time. Go somewhere else where they can pamper you silly and make you fat. Too fat to even get on to climb the mountain of God. You know, because some people have, have accused me, however wrongly, when I think about it, I'm like, yeah, they have a point though. Simply because when they came, I was too enthusiastic. I was too eager to see them be part of the work that I did not even test them. And then after a while, rather than becoming help, they became a burden. You see? So at the end of the day, I am not, you know me, I am not too, you know, phased. Because at the end of the day, I know what God has called me to. And what is important to me is not the result, it is the reward. You know, because there is a way that you can have a good result, you know, lots of results. You know, you can have several campuses planted all over the place. You can be traveling and get an invitation every other week to go speak in some corner of the earth. And people are like, man, his ministry has results. Let me tell you something, results do not last beyond the time. Reward is what is eternal. Many people have sacrificed their reward for result. Because let me tell you something, the thing about reward is when you have reward, from heaven's perspective, you have result. You know why? Because you become God's result. <laughs> Praise the Lord. So here is the deal, folks. We need to know what we are doing simply because the time is short and the Bible says the days are evil. So because I know that God brings people around us here at Communion House who have that constituent or the components of what it means to operate in the prophetic, we are happy to keep pouring. Tuesday pouring, Saturday pouring, Friday pouring. We are pouring simply because we know that we are sowing into fertile grounds. And it's that time we made up for lost time. So the Lord said to me, let me continue saying what I was saying. That we need to have more of an understanding of why we need to go to the mountain. So I'm speaking to you prophets in the house. You cannot be a prophet if you don't know how to climb the mountain of God. Being able to ascend onto the mountain of God is a requirement for prophecy. The Old Testament word for, prophet, for, for prophets is the word nebo. Or Nebu. Nebu means to see. Nebo means the mountain of seeing. You know that Moses died on the mount of Nebo, which is the mountain of seeing. That was where God took him so that he could see even further than he had ever seen. You understand what I mean? And so in order for you to have the vantage position to be able to see beyond what majority can see, you need to go to the mountain of God. When Satan wanted to show Jesus all of the kingdoms of the earth, where did he take him? He took him to a mountain. And so if you want to see beyond where you're at, you need to honor God's invitation to go to the mountains. The mountain experience is essentially the prophetic experience. Because when you are on the mountain of God, you see what he sees because that's where he lives. Do you know that many of us, the reason why we don't speak the language of God and we don't understand how to truly apply our faith is because we think God is seeing what we are seeing. Where you're at, you're surrounded by challenges, oppositions, malice, people who are not talking to you. You're surrounded by the things that you need, what you're, what you're struggling with, what you need to learn, what you need to know. And all of that overwhelms you. And that is what you want to talk to God about every day. Whereas God is not there and that is the reason why you're such a boring company. And God is like, man, I'm going to find somebody else. God loves you. He wants to give you attention. But to sustain God's attention, you have to have God's interest. No, God said it. He doesn't even hide these things. The Bible says that the eye of the Lord is running to and fro upon the earth seeking for the man whose mind is stayed on him. If your heart is stayed on God's interest, you will have God's attention. 
He will talk to you because you are saying what you're speaking from his perspective. You know many a times you go to God and you want to describe to God all of your lack. And God does not even see your lack. Because he already sees the abundance that he has for you in heavenly places. From where he's at, what you think is an issue, that which looks like a stumbling block. God is like, but from where I'm standing, that thing is a stepping stone. We put that there so you can rise even higher. So what are you talking about? Being on the mountain of God is what it means to be on the same page as God. To be operating and to be speaking at the frequency of heaven. So you want to hear God? You want to see what God sees? Let me tell you something. God is always speaking, but it doesn't make sense to you what he's describing because it's different from what you can see. Do you know that if I'm talking to you and you're outside this room and I say, yeah, well, that thing is on the right-hand side right there. No, 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 stop. Keep going. Okay, stop right there. That's where it's at. If you can't see what I'm pointing to while you're out there, it doesn't make any sense to you. You take a step, you hit the wall. But when you can see what God sees, then God's instructions begin to make sense. Because remember that usually when God speaks, he points. When I was in Sunday school, children's church, because when I say Sunday school, some people think of some old people trying to interpret the gospel to suit their own interests. No, I'm not talking about those 8 a.m. meetings at church. I'm talking about children's church. We had a missionary who came to a Bible club that I belong to. There was a time that I was a member of about four Bible clubs at the same time. Yes. So if you're asking me about the Beatles or you're asking me about movies and stuff that I don't know, that's because I wasn't doing what most young people were doing. I was going from Bible club to Bible club. I was a Bible club hopper. Yes, we went to a Bible club on Mondays that was called the Children Evangelistic Ministry. That was a Bible club. And on Wednesdays, we went to one that is called the Junior YMTS, Young Ministers Teaching School. And on Friday, we went to one that is, we, we used to call it the Pilot's Wives Bible Study because it had no name, but the lady was married to a pilot. You understand what I mean? And then on Saturday, we went to one that was called the Pre-Adult Class. Very wrong name, but very good intentions. And I remember the pre-adult class with two courses in demonology, Christian grooming and maturity, evangelism and follow-up, pastoral care and ministry. All those things were the things that I was doing when I was growing up. And that is the reason why I am very confident that there is something God is preparing me for because why would he take me through all of those things? Is it just so that I can sell books and sell tapes and honor invitations and line my pocket with honor radio? Then God would have wasted his time because I don't need that kind of upbringing. If all I need to do is raise a crowd, I can do that as a comedian. If you don't know, I can be pretty funny. It's just that quite often I'm too much in the spirit to, to be found funny. Anyway, back to what I was saying. You see, I told you, even you didn't get the joke. That's because of what I'm seeing. The Lord is saying, in order for you to be a true son of the kingdom, you need to operate from heaven's standpoint. You need to be able to see what God sees. And so, okay, let me give you one more incentive. I'm going to give you one from the life of Jesus. Come with me to the book of John chapter 4. Let's go to the book of John chapter 4, verse 48. This is an interesting one. John 4, 48. This is the gospel according to St. John, not the epistles of John, but the gospel according to John. The Bible says, then Jesus said to him, unless you people see signs and wonders you will by no means believe. <laughs> what did Jesus say? Jesus says, unless you people, see what he was saying? He was pointing at people who, were, who refused to get up from the foot of the mountain. Every single time that God spoke to Moses, while Moses went to the mountaintop, did the children of Israel hear what God was saying? No. That was why, or that was how Moses got to know the way of God while the children of Israel only knew the acts of God. What is the difference between knowing ways and knowing acts? Acts are things that have already been made manifest in the natural. Ways are things that describe the wisdom of God for operation in the realm of the spirit. So the children of Israel, they only knew God by what things he is doing. But what happens when the things that he has done have yet to materialize, guess what happened? People live like though, they live like they are godless. 
they panic, they are, they are anxious, they're afraid, they lie, they steal, they cheat, they do all those things simply because they can't see what God is doing. Uh, let, me, let, me, let me go over that again. And I know that we had a bit of a distraction, but I want to make sure that you all get it. You see, God told us for, for several weeks, Psalms 103 verse 7, what did God say? He said that we needed to meditate on it, wherein it was written that Moses knew the ways of God, but the children of Israel knew only the acts of God. Where was the acts of God perpetrated? On the ground. But where did God spell out his ways? In the mountains. When God tried to bring the mountain experience to the ground, the ground could not take it. The ground is like, I'm not made for this. The ground started to quake. And the people were so afraid for their own lives. And they were like, no, no, we can't do this. <laughs> and God was like, I thought so too. Because I'm not coming down to you. You need to come up to me. It is that time. It is that time. We're going to come back to this John chapter 4 verse 48. Let me read to you Isaiah chapter 2 because of what brother Matthew said. So if we spend 10 more minutes longer today is because of brother Matthew. Because I was going in a certain direction but when he said to me it is about time let me read to you exactly what he was saying from prophecy. Uh, where is my Isaiah? Isaiah chapter 2. Alrighty, what verse is that again? Verse 2. Yeah. It would have been easier if I was truly in Isaiah. I was looking at Songs of Solomon and I'm like, eh, it don't look like what I'm supposed to be reading. Yeah. Absolutely. You know. Praise the Lord. Come on now. Now look at what Brother Matthew just said. And then you can thank him later. Isaiah chapter 2 verse 2. The Bible says, now it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains. <laughs> the mountain will be taken to another level. The Bible says the mountain of the Lord's house shall be taken to another place and shall be exalted above the hills and all the nations shall float to it. Many people shall come and say, come let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. God lives where? On the mountains. And what? Uh, these people are there from the other class. And what does he say? The Bible says, and he will teach us his ways and we shall walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. If you want to know the ways of God, where does he teach his ways? God's conferences that reveal the mysteries of heaven are not held in the lowlands. They are held in the mountains of God. Because only the acts of God are done on the ground. The ways of God are not taught on the ground. They are taught in the mountains of God. So if God is saying, I need you to know my ways, he's telling you, you need to come up here. That mountain might be slippery, I get it. But you need to come up here. That mountain might be, you might have to contest against the water that is flowing because that water is not meant to stop on the side of the mountain. You need to overcome it so you can come up here and learn my ways. The Bible says the time is coming. When? In the latter days. I was going to gloss over that, but thank God for this man who says the time has come for us to proceed to the mountain of God. God is inviting us to come up higher. We cannot continue to be religious people. Religion has an expiration date that is synced up by God himself with the system of this world. Once this current system fully expires, if I did this expire, so the word is the Holy Spirit said to me, no, we showed you the expiration. It is expired, it's now elapsing. You know when something expires, it takes a while for it to fully decay. And that's where the world is right now. So as soon as it passes away, guess what? Religion goes with it. 
And that is the reason why we cannot remain in religion because the Bible says the ones who love the rulers of this world and their works will perish with them. So that's why the Bible says love not the world nor the things that are in the world because what you love you bind your heart to. The Lord is saying you can't be religious. You need to know me and know my ways. God has given us one incentive after another for us to recognize the significance and the importance of going to the mountain of God. So let's go back to Isaiah, I mean John chapter 4 verse 48 and see if we can close on that note. Um, I was going to go right into it and be telling you how to ascend the mountain and the Holy Spirit said to me that we need to dwell a little bit more on the incentive. Simply because when we start talking about the house, it can be a little scary. It, it, there is a price to pay. Knuckles will bleed. But the only reason why you will go through the process is because you know that there is joy when you get to that mountain. You need to know what you're going for. Because if you haven't come to know and be convinced of what's waiting for you at the top of the mountain, the experience of climbing the mountain is enough to discourage you from continuing. But then you have to keep pressing on. So what's going to keep you pressing on? Let me tell you something. Jesus, the Bible says, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame. What is that joy? The joy of knowing that children will be raised up unto the Father. And what is that joy? The joy of knowing that one day in the latter days, many will say, let us go to the mountain of God. It was that joy. And so if you do not have that joy, there's no way you're going to make it through the experience of the mountain. Because this mountain that you're climbing, you're not just climbing it with a phone in your pocket to take pictures when you get to certain levels. You're carrying a cross as you climb the mountain. Remember that Jesus, praise the Lord, Jesus had to carry his own cross to climb the hill because Golgotha was on a hill. You know, because many of us thought that Jesus just strode around the town center with his cross. No, he was climbing up a hill. Golgotha was on a hill. So Mark, no, no Mark, John chapter 4 verse 48. Jesus said this. He says, ah, <laughs> uh, hallelujah. He says, then Jesus said to them, unless you people see signs and wonders, you will by no means believe. Faith. Faith is another incentive for pursuing the mountain life. You see, Jesus says, unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. The majority of people wait until they see the acts of God before they believe. But it takes having faith to cause the acts of God. Let me take that again slowly. I don't want to be one of those people whose life is sustained by mementos and souvenirs. Some people are very happy with just living their lives based on what somebody else brings to them. Jesus says, man shall not live by bread alone. Bread is what another man has baked and presents to you. He says, well, you shall live by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. The only people that can boast of at least being close to hearing every word that proceeds from my mouth are the ones who live in my house. What did I say yesterday? You don't know? Because you were not in my house. So to know every word that proceeds from the mouth of God, which is the source of faith, you need to be on the mountain where that word of God is proceeding forth. But the people who are at the foot of the mount mountain, they only want to believe after they have seen. So the choice is yours. Do you want to be one of those people who live on manna, on the acts of God? Or do you want to be like Moses who was 40 days and 40 nights on the mountain and he didn't have to eat nor drink? The Bible says he ate not, neither did he drink. It's only by supernatural sustenance that a man can go for 40 days without water. Jesus the same. Because they were not on the ground, they were on the mountain. And the word of God sustained them. I want to encourage you some on this note guys. Jesus said something to doubting Thomas. He said to the disciples too but on the account of Thomas. Because Thomas was like unless I see I do not believe. 
did Jesus condemn him? Because if that was some of us, we'd be like, really? Now I bind you and I send you to hell. No, Jesus was like, I can accommodate that too. You have just told me where you're at and I'll meet you there. So Jesus appeared to him and showed him the holes in his hands. But he told the other people, he says, but blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. So that means there is a blessedness, a state of existence that is beyond just having life. It is called the more than abundant life. You see that blessed life is not lived by what you see, it is lived by what you hear. It is a life of faith. And that is what I want. And you should not want any less. So Jesus says, all these ones, if they don't see signs and wonders, they do not believe. But those of you who have gone to the mountains, you don't need to see anything to believe. You don't need for the situation to change before you start having joy. You don't need for the mountain to be moved before you have peace, simply because you have been with the Lord and you have heard firsthand that the Lord says, peace, be still. So if you want to have joy all the time, if you want to have righteousness all the time and peace all the time, you need to be in his presence on the mountains so that until, even before things change, you are already changed. Let me tell you something, that is the real blessed life. I can't guarantee you, neither can the Lord, that everything is going to be nice and rosy all the time because there is a time for everything. The Bible says God makes everything beautiful in its time. So not everything that you need will materialize in front of you at every time. We go through the drought, we go through the wilderness, we go through seasons of waiting for our spouses to repent, to start doing things differently. We go through seasons of having our children behaving right. There are times when they're just not behaving right no matter what you try. We'll go through all those seasons. But what will sustain you is not waiting for the act to manifest, for the sign and the wonder. What will sustain you is being on the mountain and already just knowing because God has said. So you're not living your life waiting for things. You're not living your life. You see, let me tell you something. Many of us have not even ever experienced joy. What we know is happiness. Happiness is when the miracle has happened and you can say, oh my God, have you seen what God did yesterday? For the first time I have money in my account. Oh my God, that is happiness. But happiness is so flimsy because before you know what's going on, a bill can hit that account and wipe that little money that you think you have and then you're sad once again. The same you for whom Christ died. You know how ridiculous it is? When God looks from his holy habitation, and he sees you worried over $5,000. And he's thinking to himself, is this not the same one that I already gave everything to? Yes. Paul says in Romans chapter 8, he says, if God did not withhold Jesus from you, if I didn't say did not, he says, if God could not withhold Jesus from you, he says, will he not together with him freely give you all things? Joy is not a function of things that happen Joy is a function of what has already happened. And what has already happened is that God has chosen to be for you and not against you. Praise the Lord. We're going to pray from John chapter 14 today, verse 6. And this is where we break the bread. So if Alan can help us, perhaps you and brother Matthew so that he can go very quickly. John chapter 14, verse 6. Hey, Hallelujah. So when the Lord says there will be healing today, the Lord said to me that that's what's on the back of the invitation for the meeting, but it's not what is inside. Because I was wondering when the Lord was showing this to me by the hand of his angel, about two times in the last couple of days, maybe in the last two, three days, through the ministry of an angel, I knew that the Lord was showing me something that was a development from another. He was showing me how miracles become wholeness. Miracles are a starting point. Wholeness is where God wants you to be. Remember the lepers that Jesus cleansed. They were cleansed, but they were not made whole. Being cleansed as a leper means the disease has now been terminated. But if it's already eaten up your fingers, then this is how you're going to be for as long as you shall live. The only thing is you get to keep your wrist. 
Because you know the disease of leprosy is one that continues to eat at your flesh and it allows for your tissues to crumble. So people lose the tip of their fingers. They lose their knuckles. Eventually their palms fall off. So when Jesus cleansed them, it meant that they were no longer going to suffer a degeneration. But that doesn't mean they were going to experience a restoration. Jesus touched them and cleansed them. But only one of them was made whole. The Bible says the one that came back to give him thanks. Jesus said to him that were there not 10 of you? And only this one that is even a foreigner. This one that is here illegally. I know I'm looking at you. I can tell you don't have papers. Jesus says, and that was what he told him. He said, how come it is this illegal one? This one that is even a foreigner that will return to give thanks. Jesus now says, because of what you have done. Now stretch forth your hands. And his fingers grew back. The Bible says, and he was made whole. Every single person that, touch, that, that God touches becomes cleansed. Everybody that God, that God touches receives healing. But the only people that get made whole are the ones that touch God. The woman with the issue of blood, she, she did not say, if this Jesus just touches me, I'll be fine. She says, if I may but touch the hem of his garment, I will be made whole. When God comes down from the mountain, he goes around doing good, he touches people. But only the ones who go up the mountain get to touch him. You need to learn how to go to the mountain of God so that you can be made whole. So the invitation card that God issued, on the back he said there will be healing. But what he has on the inside for those who finally, who actually make it out, he says on the inside, you are made whole. And so I tell you what folks today, when the Lord says there shall be healing in this meeting, don't stop at healing. Touch him and be made whole. To be made whole, I'll give you an instance of what was shown to me. The angel of the Lord stretched forth a rod in front of me and it has three distinct colors. And he said to me, you see this white part of what I am showing you? He said, this is glory. This is the future. He said, you see this red part? He said, that stands for healing. And the blue part, it stands for relationship and engagement. He says, when people engage God, they come in contact with the life of Christ, which is the blood of the Lamb. He says, and they are made whole, they experience the glory. He said, but at the same time, it represents the past, the present, and the future. Let me tell you something. When God makes you whole, he takes care of the past, the present, and the future. When you were traumatized as a little child and that trauma went deep to your subconscious and now it, it makes you do things that you shouldn't do. It makes you sad when there's no reason to be sad. The Lord can heal you so that you're no longer sad, but the trauma can still be there waiting for another fault in the future to rear its ugly head. But when God makes you whole, what he does is he fixes everything past, present, and future. And that happens only on the mountains. So let's read Matthew chapter 14 verse 6. Matthew 14, 6, and we're going to break bread with this particular verse of scripture. What does it say? It says, and many of you can read this thing by heart, but I want us to look at it together. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. God is inviting us to come to the mountains where we will be taught the ways of God. And Jesus says, I am that way. Once you know me, then you know the truth. Once you know me, then you have the life. And he said that as often as you have the opportunity, do this in remembrance of me. We're not called communion house for no reason. We're called communion house because of the fact that the simple thing that Jesus instituted for us to, say that again. What did I read? Yeah, that's because bro, Matthew is sitting in front of me. Oh yeah. But John 14, 6. John 14, 6, Jesus says, uh, thanks for call, pointing that out, sweetie, thank you. I am the way, <laughs> the truth and the life. Jesus says, do this in remembrance of me. I want to make a connection here. Folks, God willing, on Tuesday, we're going to progress into giving you the rudiments of climbing the mountain. But still on the incentives. The Bible says, kiss the sun and it shall be well with you. 
But can you kiss? Right now, Brother Greg, you're sitting here. Can you kiss somebody that is in Snellville? The word kiss means to make physical contact. So if you're going to kiss the sun for it to be well with you, then you need to go where the sun is. And the Lord Jesus is now on the mountain sitting at the right hand of his heavenly father. But he says, I have given you a back door. Because every time you do this, you are connecting with me directly. And so as we break bread today, I don't want you to just take it as yet one of those rituals that we have to do before we can collect the offering or before we can let you go home. I want you to do this today by actually truly believing when Jesus says, as often as you have the opportunity, do this in remembrance of me. To remember is to actually reenact someone's experience. And to experience someone is to meet them. Jesus says you can meet me when you do this. So let us rise up to our feet and begin to say to the Lord, I would say if I were you, thank you God for this invitation to come out today. To come out and drink from your mountain. To come out to be fed at your table. To come out to receive this word of remembrance. Letting me know that it is not my place to settle for the acts at the foot of the mountain. But as one that the Lord is calling to operate in the prophetic, to see what the Lord is doing before it becomes common knowledge. I need to go up to the mountains. Father, thank you for touching me, but now I am ready to come up the mountain to touch you also that I may be made whole. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, I thank you because those at the foot of the mountain are waiting for signs and wonders. But I am coming to the top of the mountain that I may become that sign and a wonder. I want to encourage you folks, God has great things in store for those who seek him. The Bible says that eye has not seen, ear has not heard, neither has it entered into the hearts of signs and wonder seeking men and women. What God has for those that will go to his mountain, the ones that will seek him. Set your heart on him release your faith at this particular moment to say you know what Lord Jesus I need a visitation and I'm happy for you to visit me but I want to visit you take me to your mountain bring me up like you brought Isaiah bring me up like you brought Elijah bring me up like you brought Moses bring me up like you took Jesus together with Moses and Elijah to the mountains and you had them transfigured Lord Bring me up. And if you're ready to come up higher, remember these are the latter days wherein the mountain of the Lord's house is being taken to the mountain of God. So from mountain to mountain, from glory to glory. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, I want to pray this prayer. I just saw the same image but this time around, it became a dynamic image. It wasn't just a picture of a rod, but the rod was spinning and it created another image. And this is what I heard. I heard that there are people in here that are just happy being in the blood. You are so content with being in the blood of the Lamb, the place of constantly getting cleansed. You're living your life always needing to be cleansed. And you are so fascinated by the fact that, oh, where sin abounds, grace abounds much more. And you're just living in that realm. And the Lord is saying it is time for you to come up higher to a place of glory. Lose your fascination for cleansing and begin to develop a fascination for glory. The Lord does not want you to continue to swim in that pool of blood. Because there is always forgiveness. There is always repentance. No, the Lord is saying, I want you to come to a place of glory wherein you are spotless continually. Hey, shumanda hu, ayemanda he. Ayemanda he, shumanda hu. Alrighty, let me say this. On Saturday, on Tuesday, the Lord said many of us are about to start having dreams. Many of us have not started having those dreams. Thankfully, I have. I'm excited because I, my soul could, almost could not wait till I got home until the Lord started to reveal certain things to me. Questions that I had been asking. So I know that that miracle has genuinely begun. 
Some people, however, are not experiencing it. And you know why? Because they dread going up the mountain. The reason why your heart is resisting, seeing what God is showing is because you're not ready to pay the price for it. You're not ready to make the sacrifice. Many of you need to fast. God has already shown you the things you need to let go of, but you're not ready. And the Lord is saying, I want you to come into those dreams, into those experiences, but you need to be ready to climb higher. And so as, as I'm speaking, if you receive the nudge in your heart, just put your hand on your heart and say, Lord, I am coming up higher. I am making the sacrifice. I am pressing in. In the mighty name of Jesus. The last prayer point before we actually break this bread is some of us need to cut the cord. There are, there are things that we have tied to our waists as we're going up the mountain. And they are weighing us down. Let me tell you three of those things. Four things were shown to me, but I'll tell you three of them. You see, many of us, there are certain things that we are packed with us thinking it is needed for the journey. One of those things is certain relationships that you continue to feed simply because you don't think you can fulfill destiny without those people. They have served their time in your life. It is time for you to move on without them. Now specifically, let me say this specifically, this is talking about certain people that have mentored you while you are still a baby Christian. The Lord is saying that you have outgrown them. Now they have become a weight around your waist. Cut the cord. Simply because we have come to idolize men over God. You know, a couple of people recently God showed their faces to me. I was thinking about them and I put them before the Lord. I said, Lord, what is going on with these people? They're not where they're supposed to be. And the Lord said to me, he said, the things that I sent you to tell them, they did not believe because it was coming from you. He says, they are still waiting for certain people that they hold in regard to say it. He says, but my word is the truth regardless of who says it. And you know why? These were the people who mentored them when they were baby Christians. But a lot of them have lost their ways. Their hearts have gone after mammon. But my brothers and sisters are still waiting for them to confirm what the Lord said. But those people, are, they don't even know. The Bible says the time is coming wherein the deceiver himself will be deceived. So some of these mentors, the Lord had shown them to me prior and I know the state of their hearts, how they have completely abandoned their places as shepherds and become hirelings doing things for mammon rather than for the glory of God. It's time to cut the cord so that you do not regard any man above God. The second thing that was shown to me is this, many of us, God is calling us to spend time with him in intimacy, but you just cannot let go of how many hours that you have committed in your heart to work that brings you money. Let me tell you something, you, it's not how long, it is how blessed. It is not how long, it is how blessed, it is not how many hours. So you need to cut the cord of your commitment to mammon in order for you to go up this mountain. You already know what you need to do. Because God did not bring me people here who are not ready to do the will of God. And so as I'm speaking, your heart, you already know what to do. And the last thing that I'm going to share with you that is a burden that is holding many people back is this one, I find it actually quite a shame. Do you know that the reason why many of us, our hearts are not really proceeding toward the mountain of God is because you know that once you do, certain people that have been friends with you, that have been close associates, you will have to leave them behind. Because your language will change the moment to approach the throne. Go and ask Isaiah. His language had to change. And so, let me tell you something. Stay married to your spouse, but don't be married to anybody else. Don't be married to any community. Don't be married to any association. Be ready to let them, because God knows that you're not ready to cut the cord. And that is the reason why he's not pulling you closer. So I want to encourage you, as God is revealing to you while I am speaking, begin to make the decision to do the incision so that you can be free of those weights that so easily besets you because the mountain is where you belong. Your father is a mountain God. You should be a mountain dweller as well. Now let us break bread. We receive the bread as the body of the Lord Jesus. Just as he said, he says, this is my body broken for you. And we receive the wine as his blood. Just as he said, he says, this is my blood that was shed for you. 
Hey, Father, in the mighty name of Jesus. Alrighty, let's do something. This is where we're going to close, finally. When we come together like this, and we come to the tent of meeting, we're in one place, and God intends for us to be in one accord. The significance of being in one place is usually there are certain places that have only one entry point. So that means if anybody wants to attack all of us, they can just wait for us at the door. So let me just tell you, because this is the spiritual warfare side of what we're experiencing right now. Very quickly, come to Micah chapter 1 verse 7. And we need to take care of certain things right now. You know, these teachings are not just theology. These teachings are spiritual in nature. Jesus says, the words that I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life. And the things of God are what? Spiritually discerned. So I don't want you to just be thinking of the logic of the things that I am saying. If I was going to be a theologian, I wouldn't be here. So this is warfare. This is what Micah 1 7 says. It says, all her carved images shall be beaten into pieces and all her pay as a harlot shall be burnt with fire. All her idols I will lay desolate for she gathered it from the pay of a harlot and they shall return to the pay of a harlot. The Lord just revealed to me that certain of us in here, the devil wants to waylay us as we're leaving the tent of meeting. He wants to take from you what you have received because you're holding something that belongs to him. You see, the Bible says Satan came to Jesus and found nothing in him. So he had to keep moving. There are certain things that we have received through harlotry. We have compromised our standards to receive certain things. And the Lord is saying that I have seen those things because you came close and now I'm revealing it to you. Let it go so that the one that awaits you at the door has nothing in you. It has to return where it came. So I'm going to pray for you. I don't want you to be thinking at this particular moment about what it might be. Let the Lord himself reveal to you. But we will pray. So Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, I thank you for the work of deliverance that is going on right this moment. Father, the things that we have received by compromising our faith, our purity, our righteousness, the things that we have received by falling for the deceitfulness of sin and allowing Satan to make an investment in us, Father, we release back to the one who gave it so that they will not take the good treasure of our heart in exchange for the fraud that they brought. Set our hearts free this moment, O oh God from every entanglement of Satan, from every gift that is not a free gift. Set our hearts free from every trap of the enemy, every wage of compromise. Let our hearts let go this moment in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, we thank you in Jesus' name. Alrighty, so now we're ready to break bread. You may eat of the Lord's body and drink of his blood in the mighty name of Jesus. Praise the Lord. Once you've had yours, sit down very quickly as the band comes up and we're just going to close out. One of the things that I want to encourage you to do is if you're not in a hurry, I know that these guys are going to be playing some music for a few more minutes. So if you just want to stay here and soak in his presence, you're welcome to do so. Uh, but very quickly, I want us to also get an opportunity to honor the Lord with our substance. The Bible says, honor the Lord with your substance. So if you have prepared an offering, or if you want to prepare one very quickly, look on the screen. There is instructions there if you're new, but if you're not, you already know what to do. Um, Alan, where is Alan? Alan, can you come forward very quickly? If somebody can find me, Alan, let him come forward very quickly. Yeah, well, you can do the basket. I need Alan to do something else. Alan, can you please come up? Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. No, no, I want you to come up here and stand in here. Praise God. And I'm going to do this very quickly. Now, let me just say this, folks. I know I mentioned it, but look, if you can be here on Tuesday, be here. Make the sacrifice that is required to be here because God is doing something. You see the progression where he's bringing us from, right from the time that we had Kosai and Del and the angel of war. You see the progression, what the Lord is doing with us. Now God has more for us in this season and he doesn't want us to miss it. 
I brought you here today because of the fact that the Lord said to me that we need to be an example to believers. You understand what I mean? And so I want the Lord to take of your experience. Like Moses prayed, he says, Lord, take of my spirit and put upon these ones that they may see as I see. You understand what I mean? The Lord stood you up in the corner of the room while we were still in the basement about two months ago and he says, I'm about to elevate you. Was he here? That I'm about to elevate your visions and your dreams so that you see things that offer the equipping of the body. Do you remember that word? And since then, you've been seeing visions and dreams of the equipping of the body. Now, as you stand here in the mighty name of Jesus, thank you, Father. The Lord says that which I inseminated within him is mature and ready to be given to others. And so, Lord, thank you for this moment. And as many hearts as are open to receive that which is happening here supernaturally by the Holy Spirit, which is this divine gifting, in the place of dreams and prophetic experiences to begin to see things of the equipping of the Spirit, let them begin to receive it now in the mighty name of Jesus. There is a flow that is going on in here. Before the service, I knew there was an impartation coming. I just didn't get the full gist of it. Now this is it. And so as many of you as want to tap into it, please tap into it because the Lord started a work and now the Lord is allowing for there to be a kind amongst us begetting after its kind. A kind of experience, a kind of impartation in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Alan, please, you can be seated. Alrighty. So, Kenyatta, why don't you come bless the offering since you already came up here. And so if you have offering envelopes or cash that you want to put into the offering basket, you can go and do that right away. Kenyatta is going to bless it and close the service. I have one more announcement to make, okay? All the other announcements have been scrolling on the screen. They will scroll, will hit you up in your email, will put things on social media. But this announcement that I want to make has got to do with Joshua chapter 1 verse 7 and 8, particularly verse 7. Many of us want to be stronger than we are. You no longer want to be hit and be shaken by what you hear, by what people do to you. But for you to be bold and to be strong, you need to do certain things about the Word of God. So I want to encourage you, if you were here on Tuesday and you heard about meditating on Joshua 1.8 and you haven't started doing it, why don't you do it now? Which is, go back to what? Start from Psalms 103 verse 7, meditate on it and graduate from there to what was the other one that was one that we did from Jeremiah that we needed to meditate upon. Jeremiah 17, 19, meditate on it and meditate on Joshua chapter one verse eight. I know the reason why I'm saying what I'm saying. Remember when the pandemic was about to begin, two months before the lockdown, the Lord said to me, tell these people that they need to find the scripture for their families to immune them against the epidemic of fear that was coming. And I told you the symptoms. We will not be able to meet our church. There was going to be the propagation of fear in the news and the rumors of war. But you cannot afford for your oh, feet gee. to be removed. What did the Lord say? He said, you need a scripture for your family. Now the Lord is telling us to meditate upon his word. G. Because something is about to happen. Do not wait until it becomes news. Because by the time it becomes news, it is already stale. Here today. What did I say? 103 verse 7 of Psalms. Jeremiah 17, 19. And then the last one, Joshua chapter 1 verse 8. Write these things on your wall. Meditate on them. You will need it in the days to come. Now, the Lord said to give you an update. You remember that we prayed on Tuesday about the eruption that was coming from the east that was supposed to stir up war coming from the west. The Lord said to let you know that the situation has been arrested, but we will still hear of it. Isn't that awesome? Praise the Lord. God is good. One last thing before you pray. The Lord showed me a basket right now and it says you have been fishing with the basket and you're sorrowing that you're not holding water. The Lord says, I did not intend for you to hold water. I intended for you to hold fish. God is blessing you, but you're looking for something else. So if you're here today and you have been sorrowing over water, stop. 
When I say stop, I'm not advising you. I am declaring over you that your heart will stop to sorrow over that which you are bleeding out on and focus on what you are retaining. God is doing a work in your life, but Satan wants you to miss it. Alrighty, Josephine, I know that that word is making sense to you. You understand what I mean? Let the water continue to flow out of your basket, but you know what to do with the fish. Alrighty, I wish I could stay here for two more hours, but I couldn't, I, I can't, and I shouldn't. Some will let you loose, but Kenyatta is going to bless the offering. Now, one more thing. This is different from your three verses of scripture that you're meditating on. Alrighty, Matthew chapter 7, 11. You all remember what is in there. Just pray that over yourself. Okay, don't meditate too much so that you can focus on the other three, but pray that over yourself. In fact, I need to help somebody understand it. And then Kenyatta is going to pray and we're going to go home before Bennett comes to drag me from here. Um, Matthew chapter 7 verse 11. This is what it says. And Joshua, you can stop the recording now if you need to. This is not for public consumption.